Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Sergey. I'm um, a researcher, protocol researcher at Vaku. Uh, I'm going to give you some information about Vaku, what it is, why you may want to use it for your hackathon project, and then I will show um, some kind of a demo in the end. So actually, it's more of a talk than a workshop, but there is some practical part in the end also, if you want to follow along. So yeah, uh, thanks to my colleague Guru for some pictures that I shamelessly stole from his presentation. He's also around. You can talk to him if you want about Vaku. I'll talk a little bit about privacy and communication in Web3. Uh, I will give an intro about Vaku and then show how to run a node. So, uh, okay, I don't think I'll surprise anyone if I say that Web2 communication is not very private. So there are centralized gatekeepers that collect your data and harvest your information, blah, blah, blah. I think you've heard this multiple times already, so like, duh. But Web3 communication is not very private either. So uh, as you may have gathered from the last talk, for example, or from some other sources, uh, many of dApps that use decentralized technologies at some point point of their, or like some part of their uh, software stack also rely on many centralized um, services such as RPC providers uh, and so on. So there's lots of potential of privacy being eroded um, there. And uh, of course users also do not or cannot run their own nodes because it's hardware requirements are not, um, like users just cannot afford it basically. So Web3 needs a secure communication layer and yeah, I must admit that in the end I'll also be using an infra endpoint in my presentation, so that's uh, gradual decentralization, I guess, progressive decentralization. Uh, so the, uh, the OGs in the room might remember then uh, that when Ethereum started in 2013, 14-ish, it was uh, pitched as these three pillars of new internet and Ethereum was only one of those three pillars. It was um, a blockchain needed for consensus and financial transactions. But there were also two other pillars, namely Swarm for data storage and Whisper for communication, like ephemeral communication. And um, I, don't know I don't know much about Swarm. Uh, I think it is still uh, being developed in some shape. Uh, Whisper, as far as I am aware, not, is, is not very actively developed. And Vaku, in some sense, can be thought of as a, um, a spiritual successor, if you will, of Whisper. I even have a, a quote from um, a post by Vitalik who mentions Vaku as a continuation to Whisper and one of the ways to make Ethereum uh, cypherpunk again. So uh, citing the website of Vaku, Vaku is a family of robust censorship resistant communication protocols designed to enable privacy focused messaging for Web3 apps. And I will explain in a bit more detail further in the presentation what all these words mean. So uh, also I want to stop uh, quickly and uh, explain what Vaku is not. First of all, Vaku is not a blockchain. So uh, Vaku uses blockchains in some uh, way. I will explain later how exactly, but we don't have our own token. We don't have consensus. We are a messaging layer or a data communication layer for dApps or just apps in general who um, uh, that want to use privacy uh, communication. So also Vaku is not a messenger. So you may have heard of status. Status is a messenger and Vaku has grown out of status in some form. So Vaku uh, is a generalized communication protocol that uh, messengers like status can use on the back end, but Vaku is not necessarily a back end for mes messengers. It can be also used as a part of the stack for other applications. I'll talk a bit more about that later in, 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 in the talk. And also Vaku is not a long-term storage solution. So things like Filecoin or StoreJ or a project called Codex, which is also of this um, kind of branched out of status, um, similar to how Vaku has emerged. Um, Vaku is not long-term storage, rather uh, Vaku is for ephemeral communication and although nodes are supposed to store some pieces of history relative to the recent history, uh, generally you should not expect that you can query some node for a message that was broadcast a year ago and get some result, probably you wouldn't get a result. So uh, generalized communication layer, let's uh, dig deeper into that, so what it means exactly. Uh, or rather, <laughs> rather, uh, as long as uh, you probably are hackers and you will be thinking or are thinking right now what to develop during this wonderful hackathon, I can give you a few ideas and a few um, points to think about that maybe motivate you to look deeper into Vaku and um, 
look at our docs, look at our documentation, and so on. So uh, what can Vaku be used for? Of course, chats and messengers are one use case. It's quite a popular one, so oftentimes when people uh, on the hackathons, during conferences, or something else, discuss what can be built on top of Vaku, of course, messenger is one popular idea. And you, you could try to do that. Uh, many people have uh, tried, I must say, so it's not too original, but you may try if you want. So what other things can we build on Vaco? Uh, we can build something related to voting and proposals. So we have lots of projects nowadays that have some kind of DAO, that have some voting going on, that decides on the governance of various things. So uh, perhaps the votes that the voters uh, send somewhere should be private and should not be visible, for example, to other uh, voters, uh, which may change their voting preferences depending on what they see in the open, uh, in the open network. So uh, VACO can be used to make these votes private or otherwise um, make a voting protocol that's um, secured against the threat that are relevant to your security model. We can think also about off-chain uh, systems like state channels, uh, like layer two. So we can think of some off-chain um, off-chain state machines, if you will, that maintain some kind of state, and they may or may not anchor this state to some blockchain, but to update this state, to exchange information between uh, the instances of this machine, Vaco can also be used. Another use case that I think is quite uh, practical, I would say, or at least I can like have some personal experience and I understand what the user's pain is, is when you use a multi-signature wallet, you want to co-sign a transaction, and imagine you have a few signers, they are in different places, the keys are held by different entities, and you want to do a multi-sig transaction, then you have to coordinate somehow how if like Alice and Bob need to sign a transaction, Alice has submitted her signature, now where does she broadcast this half-signed signature to? What does she use to send it to Bob? Uh, she could do it by, I don't know, by email or by whatever. Vaco could be one of the options also to use there. Layer two coordination. Uh, most likely you've heard about Ethereum rollup centered scaling roadmap. Rollups are very popular nowadays. And within the rollup ecosystem, there are lots of activities or roles that, um, need some kind of coordination. So uh, although rollups are uh, kind of centralized in many parts of their architecture, uh, they, at least, they plan to move towards decentralization. If we imagine a future where, for example, rollup sequencers are not just some one server, but rather a network of independent nodes, how they will exchange information among themselves. Again, Vaku may be part of that stack. And if you want to learn more or get inspiration and more ideas, you can visit this website, ideas.vaku.org, where we have a list, like, multiple times more than I've just uh, discussed, a list of ideas that you could use an inspiration for your uh, projects for the hackathon. So with that, I hope I gave you some motivation of why you should care about Vaco. And now I'll tell you a bit more about how it is designed and what, uh, what is actually under the hood. So um, the design principles that Vaco is based upon are, first of all, want to be generalized. It's not just um, it's just uh, not just messengers, not just chats, but any payload, any data that applications want to um, want to exchange may be exchanged over Vaco. It is permissionless. Anyone can join the network. It's not like some network operated just by its own developers. Although Vaco does run some Vaco nodes in the Vaco network, you can join the network and no one will stop you and you can relay the messages just as uh, as anyone else. It is decentralized. No single point of failure. It's kind of uh, at least in this audience, I think it's, t it's like t table stakes, uh, of course. Uh, it's adaptive, it's suitable for a wide range of devices. So uh, we have a family of protocols, actually. It's not just one protocol, it's a family of protocols. And you can uh, switch some, some of these protocols on and off, depending on your hardware um, uh, specifications. You may uh, decide to use the full relay protocol and be part of the peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, or your architecture may involve a full node that you run, for example, but your users will communicate in a more lightweight fashion with this full node using light protocols that we also have. So you can um, be adaptive and flexible depending on the hardware. Privacy preserving, of course. Uh, we don't have any linkability between senders and receivers. Of course, uh, I must say like some attacks may be possible and some data analysis may be possible, but we don't have the notion of, okay, Alice sends a message to Bob. Alice sends a message to the network it has been broadcast to all the nodes in the, in the particular topic, and then it's up to Bob to um, get this message and understand that it actually is intended for him. And uh, last but definitely not the least, 
denial of service resistant. I think this is the core innovation of Baco. We use zero knowledge for rate limiting. The technology is called rate limiting nullifiers or RLN, and I will discuss a bit more later on how it works. So we have the backbone protocol that is called Vaco Relay, and it is used to distribute messages in a peer-to-peer -peer network. It is based on top of Lib P2P, so you may have heard of Lib P2P as the peer-to-peer uh, -peer data exchange protocol that, for example, Ethereum itself uses for dissemination of transactions. We are more generic than that. We are built on top of that and can be used for uh, all types of messages, not necessarily blockchain transactions and not necessarily financially, um, you know, related transactions. We also have light protocols, and examples of those include light push uh, that allows a light node to send a message to a particular topic, uh, like basically ask a full node to relay a message on its behalf. Filter allows a light node to subscribe to messages from a particular topic, so if the light node doesn't have that much bandwidth, um, it may submit this filter to a full node and then receive only a a subset of messages that, is, that, is, that are interesting to this particular light node. And store allows a light node to query the full node to get a history of recent messages. And uh, yeah, this is not supposed to be a long-term storage, but if the light node uh, was offline for some uh, reasonably short period of time, I think, I mean, it's the matter of configuration of the full nodes, but something on the order of hours, I think, could be reasonable, or one hour at least, no, but not, like, not much more. So this is how it could be visualized. So we have different kinds of nodes. They operate in uh, different relay shards. So I haven't talked much about sharding, but basically we have a network that is divided by topic and nodes may choose to participate in the topics of their interest and uh, there may be intersections of those circles. And we also have light nodes on the periphery that connects to the full nodes of their choice uh, to get some information from their uh, interest. Uh, and yeah, uh, so basically this picture also uh, demonstrates how we can vary the resources required to run a node depending on your preferences. You can configure your node to be uh, a full node or a light node or specify the exact set of protocols that you are interested in using. Yeah, again, just to um, solidify the conceptual model, basically we don't have a sender sending to a particular receiver, receiver, rather we have the message senders sending to the network, the messages propagate through the network, and then uh, the network doesn't know that messages one and two, for example, are intended to the same recipient, and so on. It's just the recipient's business. Now, to make the presentation a bit more interactive, I want to ask you guys a question. How do you think we can prevent excessive usage of resources in permissionless anonymous networks? So, how can we make it so that the user or the attacker can come along and just send a billion messages within a second? Any ideas? Hash cash. Hash cash. Wonderful idea. Beautiful. No, seriously. Uh, that's one idea. Yeah. Anything else? Hash cash is definitely cool. I mean, it was intended for, the, for this purpose initially, right? So yeah, uh, we could think about reputation, of course. Like, we can just ban you if you behave badly, but that requires us to know who you are and link your messages together, which, of course, is harmful for privacy, and we don't want to do that generally. Although I must say there are proposals or there are scientific works that enable decentralized reputation or some kind of peer-to-peer -peer reputation establishment, but uh, we're looking at those as well, but uh, it's kind of a research area. Proof of work otherwise known as Hashcash, could be useful. Um, and as far as I understand, Whisper has tried uh, this idea. It didn't work out that well because it turned out that uh, for end user devices, it is still too resource uh, consuming. But for attackers, it's uh, basically the attackers can just over, over hash the users. Uh, proof of something else, we could think about these as well. Proof of stake requires some financial aspect of the protocol that we don't have for now and that would require more, you know, the whole other kind of worms. Payments, incentivization, again, like financial incentives uh, may be a research area, but the answer that I'm kind of hinting towards is our rate limiting nullifiers aspect of the protocol. Rate limiting nullifiers is Vacu's approach for rate limiting. It is based on zero knowledge and the mechanics generally is as follows. So if you want to send a message to the network, first you must register with a smart contract on chain. And then when you send the message, along with this message you send a zero knowledge proof that for a particular epoch, for the current epoch in time, you indeed are a member of the current membership set. 
And the key feature is that due to the properties of zero knowledge proofs, you don't have to reveal um, your identity. You don't have to reveal which member you are. You just prove that you are one of the members, but not tell anyone what member you are. And then for each message, each node that relays this message in the network, the relay nodes, they check the proof against the state of the contract. And if indeed you have the right to send a message, then they forward your message. If you have already used your right to send one message within a given time epoch, they will just drop your message. So this is how it works for, uh, for now. In the RLN white paper that has been published um, a few years ago, maybe two years ago, the mechanism also involves financial penalties like slashing. So you also would submit some kind of deposit to the contract that would be slashed when you misbehave or when you send messages too often. But uh, it has not been implemented yet. It's on the, um, on the roadmap, maybe will be implemented at some point, but not in the nearest future. So, yeah, this is a diagram from the recent paper that um, my colleagues and myself wrote. Basically, it was uh, presented at a scientific conference, I think, about a week ago, where we measured the latency that RLN adds to the overall um, function of the network. And of course, if you think about, okay, now the sender has to generate this proof, and each step of the way, every relaying node has also to verify these proofs. Maybe it's too slow, maybe it will make the network unusable, but we have actually measured this and simulated that. So Alvaro, a colleague of mine, researcher uh, at VACU, has uh, done some simulations, both in the single host environment and also by nodes deployed in different geographic locations. And Long story short, it is kind of okay. It is no, not noticeable for sure, but it doesn't make the network so slow as uh, to make it unusable. So it's still on the order of hundreds of milliseconds or seconds perhaps, depending on the size of the message. So moving more towards uh, practical things, we have a few implementations of VACO. So the implementation is based on specs. So we have specs and multiple interoperating implementations support the set of specifications. The main one, or at least I, I could say the one that uh, gets new research ideas implemented first is called NVACO. It is implemented in NIM, which is a programming language that may not be so well known, but uh, just for curiosity, who has heard of NIM, a programming language? Wow, cool. Some people have heard of it. So yeah, this language aims to be, um, I think, as they write on their websites, uh, as fast as C and as readable as Python, uh, which, I mean, I think they do a reasonably good job in that. So we have NVACO. We also have Go, VACO, and Go, and JS, VACO, and JavaScript. We also have SDKs. So you can uh, refer to the documentation and to the website to find out how you can integrate, what's the best way for you to integrate VACO uh, for your project. Uh, yeah, just as an example, um, a screenshot from the, one of the core documents, one of the core specifications that specifies the VACO message data uh, format just to show you what is inside. If, you, um, if you're going to be using VACO, perhaps you would be creating such messages and wrapping some of the uh, application specific data uh, into these messages. So we just have uh, the payload, which is, an, uh, which is uh, of type bytes, something basically whatever you want to put there. Uh, any encryption or any uh, encoding is up to the um, application, up for you to decide. We have a content topic that specifies how, like, which nodes will receive this message, version of the protocol, timestamp. Uh, the meta field allows to, speci to specify some more application-specific data, and the Boolean flag ephemeral um, signifies whether the message should be stored in the context of the store protocol or not. Uh, we, like, we don't give guarantees. It's more of a recommendation for nodes, but if we assume that a node is well-behaving, if the message is ephemeral, it will be just relayed and forgotten about. If it is not ephemeral, it will be stored for uh, some time on the order of hours, perhaps. Now, apart from the set of specifications and the uh, multiple interoperating implementations, uh, we also have the VACO network. So similar to blockchains, I guess, you could take the um, open source code of a blockchain and deploy it into your own private instance and have a private blockchain. and Maybe it makes sense for some, uh, but the main benefits of blockchains can be realized when it is one global common network and common source of truth for multiple independent applications. So along these lines, we have deployed the VACO network in uh, late 2023, and it has sharding enabled by topic. It has privacy preserving rate limiting, 
basically this zero knowledge mechanism that I've been talking about. So this uh, works already. Uh, for now, this RLN mechanism is deployed on Sepolia testnet, so it's not on mainnet yet. But for Hackathon, I think it's it's an advantage actually. You only need Sepolia ETH, which I think you can get. Uh, through the faucet as uh, described previously by the organizers. And fully permissionless, anyone can join and uh, no barriers to entry whatsoever. Okay, I, I will try to uh, follow the instructions and show you how to launch an NVACU node. Basically, how can we do that? So we have this web page. Uh, have I shown you the core code? Okay, so. If you want to follow along, or if you want to bookmark this website, basically it's docsvacu.org, and you can navigate from there. There are multiple ways to run a node. Mm, perhaps the simplest one or the most straightforward one includes uh, Docker Compose. There are others. Of course, you can uh, compile from source. You can run in your own uh, instance on whatever cloud service or on your own machine, however you prefer. So. Uh, what will happen now? So I will make okay. So okay. So uh, basically, nothing too surprising here. Uh, the prerequisites for this uh, for this to work is of course Git or GitHub, Docker and Docker Compose. Uh, I have the stuff installed. I'm not sure like if it makes sense to uh, try to install it at the at this point. I don't know. But anyway, one thing about Docker I should say is that probably you should install it uh, if you're using Ubuntu-based or Ubuntu-like system using APT because they have also multiple ways to install Docker with APT. Uh, APT it is uh, working for me as, as intended. Uh, you need a Sepolia WebSocket endpoint, and you need a wallet with Sepolia Ethereum. This is a bit outdated. I think you need more Sepolia ETH, really, than mentioned here. But in any case, uh, I think it's less than one ETH, definitely. And a password. So um, what I'm going to do first, oops, I'm going to do is to clone repo and then you got to configure the setup so in the repo there is the example env file so this contains basically a few fields that you should set up if you would like to um, to run your node. So you have to uh, fill in here the RPC URL for Sepolia endpoint, the testnet private key from your testnet wallet. Perhaps not the best way to manage private keys, I must admit, but this is how it works for now. It is testnet. Uh, so I guess we can be a bit more reckless than with real funds. And the password that would protect your RLN membership. A few optional fields or are also there, and please refer to the docs to um, to set them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to copy over my existing end file that um, I won't show on the screen because it contains my private key, <laughs> albeit from a testnet account. And then, following the instructions, I will run the script, and the script. Uh, does what it says on the cover, namely it registers my RLN membership. I wonder if it works. I hope it works. So what is hopefully happening right now is we are communicating to the smart contract on the Sepolia testnet and it registers a new address as a member of the membership set. So again, this doesn't, for now, this does not require any additional fee apart from just paying the gas fees to the testnet. Fantastic. So your membership has been registered on chain, says the terminal, which is actually very good. Furthermore, we can launch our node 
and see what happens then. We have launched the node. Uh, maybe we should give it just a couple of minutes to something for something to show up here. Okay, while it is being launched or why it is launching, I'll show you a bonus slide with a very intriguing title. Uh, <laughs> just to kind of shield my own uh, research direction, I must say. So maybe you're wondering, is there any incentivization? Is there any token involved or something like that? I must say that there are no tokens for now, at least uh, we don't have any financial incentives, but this is a direction that some thought has been put into. So the question, of course, is how to motiv motivate nodes to join, like why do anything at all here? And our thinking currently is that for vacuum relay, for the main peer-to-peer -peer protocol, uh, it's mostly tit for tat for the foreseeable future at least. So we think basically like in blockchains, like in Ethereum or Bitcoin, there is no explicit financial incentives for node to relay the blockchain data. And we assume that nodes do that because they get the benefit of being part of this common system. But for light protocols, we see there uh, a possibility of more client-server type of interactions. So if we envision some service for a light, for, 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 for light nodes that would, for example, request the history from full nodes, that may involve some payment of some kind at some point. So this is something that we are working on, and you can have a look at the incentivization document that we've, we've put together that has some research directions and questions that we would need to answer to uh, move in that direction. So this is actually uh, quite fascinating. So let me have a look of whether this started working or not. Uh, somewhat. So ideally, when you run a node, you have automatically a dashboard deployed at local host at this address, and it shows the statistics about your node, peers connected, how much traffic you have received, how messages you have relayed, and so on and so forth. Of course, it has, uh, it needs uh, some time to connect. So uh, I can try to do the next step that I planned. I don't know if it works. REST API, so basically yeah, coming to the pr most practical part, if you want to use uh, the Vacu node in your project, that maybe the way to connect to that node is through the REST API. We also have SDKs, uh, look at the documentation, but from what I understand, the best way to connect to the Vacu network uh, that I mentioned earlier is through REST API. And there are some examples in the documentation that allow you to do just that. So I'm gonna try to try this out and see if it works. Not really, actually. So not all demos go according to plan. So, okay, I'll just try the, the hello world kind of command in the Vacu contest that sends a message to the network that says hello Vacu network from anonymous uh, user, encodes it in base 64 and posts it to the topic identified by the string, which is a common standard of, of naming content topics in Vaco. So you have application name, version, something else, and the proto as the encoding protobuf, protobuf that, we, that we use here. I'm not sure it actually worked as intended. Probably not. <laughs> I don't know how impressive this is, actually. Because when I tried this at home, it did require a few minutes to kind of bootstrap because it is searching for nodes and it has a peer discovery mechanism that is working under the hood to discover actually new nodes to connect to. Uh, but in any case, in any case, what I can recommend definitely is to check out various resources that we have, namely the documentation on Vacu.org the Discord, where you can ask questions, connect with the team and other users. Uh, look at the examples page that shows you some potential uh, examples of how to use it or integrate it. The Ideas website also I have mentioned before. And the Awesome Vaco is also really awesome, I must say. So it contains a list of workshops, a list of past hackathon projects, so I think this could be really valuable for you as hackers to see what has been implemented or what has been tried on various hackathons in the past. 
And as you may see, there's quite a lot of stuff. Uh, so please take a look at, at these things. OK, so uh, even though the demo wasn't too impressive, and I'm not sure everything worked as intended, <laughs> but after all, this is really work in progress, and research and development has been very active. Feel free to connect with me or with other people from VACO who are around. And uh, yeah, please uh, let me know if you have any questions. Are there any questions? Not really. I have one. So you mentioned that you guys use uh, Discord. When will you use something uh, that actually has Waku under the hood for, for your own uh, chat client? Wonderful question. I think the answer is uh, soon TM. The, the, the answer would be, yeah, I mean, I want to say status, but I like, uh, I'm not sure I should commit to some particular, um, uh, particular deadlines on that matter, but at least in my opinion, it could be a very natural use case. That's all, folks. <laughs>